Good afternoon, everyone. What a joyous occasion to be here in person, alive and well <laughs> at this time. Uh, it's my, pleasure. my name is Alice Kizekova and I work at the Institute of International uh, Relations Prague as a, a coordinator for the Asia Pacific Unit. And we are a very small group, but China, which is the primary focus today, is one of our main preoccupations, obviously. Um, it is my pleasure to invite um, Professor Peter Hayes Greece um, from Manchester um, or University of Manchester, who is the director of the Manchester China Institute, to talk about his research findings that we are very interested to hear because uh, he studies um, countries from this region and compares the political, um, I guess, psychology of uh, international relations but also, I imagine, of people living in these countries and how they view China. He, some of his main uh, preoccupations are exactly the dynamics between um, trust and mistrust and uh, perception and misperception, something that is so topical when we deal with um, Chinese topics. And, and he contributes to the British and Chinese dialogue um, in his work and uh, hopefully he'll also contribute to, contribute, will contribute to the Czech dialogue, um, which can be sometimes quite polarized when it comes to China. So. Um, I will give word to uh, Dr. Richard Tuchani, who is uh, the lead um, in this collaboration today. He'll introduce the project uh, that is behind this uh, event today and uh, whatever he feels is necessary to say. And then we'll have a presentation of about 20 to 30 minutes and discussion. So, enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's very exciting to be in the event, really. I think last time I spoke to more than two people in person was about two years ago, so <laughs> I hope I still remember how to do that. No, uh, first of all, let me thank to personally to Alisa, people from conference service here and the uh, overall Institute of International Relations. Uh, we're very happy that we can uh, jointly again organize this event. I think about two years ago we, we, we had an event here, so it's great to be back. Um, also about two years ago we had Peter Gries first time visiting us in Olomouc, not Prague. Well, let me say a few words about our project and then I will, I will pass it to Pete. So uh, I work at Palatsky University Olmos at a research project called Sinophone Borderlands, Interaction at the Edges. And um, it's a five years, quite big academic research project studying a lot of interactions between China or Chinese speaking world and kind of other issues. Um, I am one of the leads of political science work, work package. And uh, basically, two years ago, we started working on um, large public opinion surveys. And we were influenced a lot by Peter Gris' work. And uh, it was really great that he accepted our invitation to come here. And then we put together the first survey, which we did in 13 European countries. We got results a year ago. And then together with Pete, we already published uh, three articles. So um, then, of course, you're also, uh, I encourage you uh, to check these articles out. Today, Pete will be talking about one of those articles. And um, just the final thing, we are going to continue with this uh, research, studying how the world perceives China. So we plan to do another public opinion survey in Asia, then in developing world, then again in, in Europe. So this really became one of the kind of our main uh, research direction. Looking forward to cooperation with Pete as well, and over to you. Thank you, Richard, um, and thank you, Alicia, uh, for hosting. Um, I look forward to learning more about IIR uh, and hopefully working with IIR in the future, and I'm very excited to continue working with Richard and the team um, at Palaki University, uh, which has done such a great job uh, with these surveys. Um, so the the paper um, that I'm going to do most of the presenting on today um, comes out of that first wave of data that, that Richard mentioned. Um, uh, yeah, Alicia already went over this, but I'm a, my angle, I think you'll slowly pick up, is one of political psychology 
um, which is to say, essentially, I'm interested in using theories and methods from social psychology to understand um, not intergroup relations at the level of race or gender, but instead national identity. So how who we are as Americans, as Chinese, as as Czechs, um, how those those identities shape how we interact with one another, and how sub identities and ideologies um, shape our perceptions and misperceptions, trust and mistrust uh, between countries. Um, and very important that although I'm doing the presenting today, the paper that I'm presenting is co-authored with Richard. Um, this particular collaboration really worked very well because Richard has already done quite a bit of work um, from a qualitative methodological perspective on how Czech politics is divided over China. And I took a deep dive into our actual survey data, and then we had many conversations about how to interpret that in light of the, the situation in the Czech Republic. And it all kind of came together very, very well, and I'm, I'm really pleased with the result. To me, it's actually a model of what the best of co-authorship can be. Um, the, the, uh, it's, not, it's usually co-authorship where one person basically does everything. Um, <laughs> But sometimes the, the sum is greater than the parts, and I think this article is that. Um, Richard already talked to you about the broader project that this is part of. <coughs> so the way I thought I would uh, jump into the topic, um, you know, this hot topic, this hot question over the last maybe five years, uh, certainly up until COVID, there was increasing alarm about China's growing role um, in Central and Eastern Europe, um, big discourse about, you know, is, is China going to divide Europe? Is China using Central and Eastern Europe as a wedge because Western Europe isn't friendly enough? Is China going to be able to divide and conquer? And, you know, analysts were pointing to things like uh, the 16 plus 1 platform, which later expanded to the 17 plus 1 with the addition of Greece about three or four years ago. Uh, that's a story that I look forward to getting into with our future research, uh, which hopefully will include surveys of Greece um, and other southern European countries. Of course, most recently, it's gone back down from 17 to 16. Uh, one of the Baltic countries has dropped out. Um, pro probably many of you are familiar with that story. But you know, until this kind of most recent chapter, there was a lot of alarmism about um, China's growing role in Central and Eastern Europe. And one of the questions that was part of that discourse was, you know, whether because they, they were former communist countries, this is one of the things that holds the CEE together, is that Cold War experience, might they again align themselves with a communist superpower? Um, so might we see a kind of repeat of, of the Cold War? Um, but another way to kind of flip the question around is, you know, might their past experience of communism actually generate suspicions of China in Central and Eastern Europe? And of course, this is the perfect place to ask that question uh, here in the Czech Republic, um, given the actual Czech experience uh, during the Cold War. Um, and then another question that is central to this, especially among more traditional rail politique um, kinds of security analysts um, who are interested in alliances, um, balance of power, you know, very valuable concepts in uh, analyzing uh, international relations and, and thinking about uh, future foreign policy among great powers. Um, does this idea of China growing close closer to Russia, is this something that uh, the West should be concerned about? Um, does China benefit from being seen as a close partner uh, with Russia? You know, is this the sort of the old specter of the Sino-Soviet alliance from the 1950s and the early part of the Cold War? Um, is that something that will benefit China in the region? Or, again, flipping the, the question on its head, um, might associating with Russia actually increase 
suspicions that the people of Central and Eastern Europe uh, might have of China, in fact, undermining its influence or, or um, making its image more, more negative. Um, and here I just pulled an old propaganda poster. Um, I don't know if this is a Chinese one or a Russian one, but it's a bilingual one. To me, it looks like a Chinese pro propaganda poster, but um, you know, does that, do, do those memories of Sino-Soviet uh, cooperation from, especially from the 50s before the Sino-Soviet split, um, you know, is that a good thing for China when it comes to CEE public opinion or not? Um, so those are the questions that motivated um, this initial dive into the CEE data in the first round of the Sinophone uh, surveys. Um, and what we ended up um, coming away from the statistical analysis and the qualitative analysis that Richard and I uh, conducted together um, is that, well, this, this part of the argument you could probably make just from you know, looking at elite level Developments. So I, I mentioned the recent change from 17 plus 1 to 16 plus 1. More and more uh, concern the latest meeting of, of 17 plus 1, even before it went back to 16 plus 1, was a real step back. Um, so we were already seeing at the elite level troubles on the horizon, and I think that the public opinion data that we analyzed reinforces that argument. Um, and we want to go further based on our survey data and argue that there is a downside for China in growing close to, to Russia. Um, what we find is uh, considerable evidence from the public opinion data that attitudes towards communism in Russia can darken uh, attitudes towards China. Um, although there are large differences between the, the CEE publics, of these six different countries that we look at, and I'll talk about that a little bit more shortly, we found that three different variables mattered a lot in all of them and seemed to structure the ways that citizens in these countries thought about China. And those were a kind of self-identification as belonging more to the East or West. So we had a question where we asked people on a one to seven scale, do you see yourself as more of the East or of the West? Um, and then we had questions about um, your own country's communist past. So how do you feel about, you know, the survey here in the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia, the, the, the history of communism under, uh, under Czechoslovakia, and then also about communism today as a political system. And then we had questions about how do you feel towards countries like Russia and China. And what we found was a kind of common structure um, in terms of how those related to one another, although there were differences in the weights of different parts of it. Um, and that's what we're going to share with you today. Um, so first, a little bit of background. Let's sort of put things in historical context. Um, global attitudes towards China have deteriorated substantially. I mean, this has been a major thing in the news. This is not just revealed in, in our Sinophone surveys, but also in other surveys. But um, clearly, COVID-19, uh, hardening of uh, PRC policies um, from in places like Xinjiang um, with the so-called re-education camps um, for Muslims to the crackdown in Hong Kong, uh, but also, you know, much more clearly international conflicts. So China fought a border war with India, um, significant clash with, I believe, a couple dozen uh, fatalities. Um, and there have been more aggressive military actions in the East uh, China Seas um, and into the South China Seas um, as well. And then I would argue that on top of that, and actually Richard has written separately about this as well, um, but that the Xi Jinping administration made, a, I think, a pretty conscious decision after COVID broke out and countries like Australia, um, which were very quick to start asking for transparency and answers about this, um, China was not going to be transparent, it was not going to concede anything, it was going to go on a counteroffensive, 
And that was particularly clear in Europe, where a number of ambassadors really were quite pugnacious, uh, playing to audiences, nationalist audiences at home, and you know, actually winning sort of glory for China with domestic audiences. But I think that the public opinion survey data suggests that this may have rebounded against China in terms of its, its international image. That some of these um, things that Chinese ambassadors in Europe said um, led to pretty large reactions among the European publics involved. And so that probably also contributed to this deterioration of uh, European attitudes towards China. So Pew um, did a survey um, in the summer and fall, I think, of, of last year. And whoops, um, very clear uh, increase in negative attitudes towards China across the board. Um, I borrow from Pew here because they do their sur surveys annually, so you can look at change across time. And basically what this shows is a, a big increase in negativity towards China. Um, almost across the board. Um, our survey um, from fall 2020, um, our six cases were the Czech Republic, Hungary, Latvia, Poland, Serbia, and Slovakia. Clearly they're not representative of all CEE countries, which is a very complex, heterogeneous set of countries. Um, however, their diversity in terms of population size, geographic location, and their pre-communist, communist, and post-communist pasts actually allowed for some interesting comparisons and contrasts. And indeed, we're going to take the Czech Republic and Poland as two kind of extreme examples when we, um, when we look more closely at the data. Um, so having this diverse set of countries, even if they're not representative, allows us to explore the drivers of both similarities and differences between these six countries uh, but it also allows us to look within the countries at different kinds of cleavages that may um, uh, divide the publics of those countries in terms of their, the way they think about China. Um, okay, so uh, just to, to kind of start getting into the data, um, this is a question, I don't know if you can read vertically, I'm not quite sure why I did that. <laughs> I think that's where there was space, <laughs> so you will have to read vertically. Uh, how do you feel about the following countries? Um, and I pulled out the, the great powers here, at least uh, from a, a European perspective. Um, and just, there are a lot, we could talk about this almost infinitely, but just to take a, a couple examples, our, our core interest is how do you feel about China? Notice that the most positive country is Serbia, and Serbia is indeed the exception to the rule in Europe as a whole. Almost all countries in Europe, on average, are negative towards China. Serbia is really the only country that is positive about China. Um, and guess who's over here on the other end of the continuum? Uh, among the publics of these six countries, on average, it's the Czech public that's the most negative. Um, so, you know, what's going on here? This you know, makes intuitive sense. I saw some heads nodding. Um, Pro-Western Czechs support places like Tibet and Taiwan and oppose China. So this probably brings the average down. Although when we look more closely at the data, even the supporters of the current Czech president um, are, are not positive about China. They're just less negative. <laughs> So there is a cleavage there, but the whole thing is lower. Um, Serbia, we could talk at length about as well. Um, it is a situation with much more state control of the media. So you know policies that have been very much about kind of hedging their bets with Russia by playing close to China, I think have filtered down into Serbian public opinion. Um, the Russian case, again, you know, Serbia is the highest, and here, uh, what do we have, Poland is the lowest on Russia, and we'll come back to that in a moment, but that really shouldn't surprise us at all, right? Poland is it's consistent with other survey results 
uh, Pew and Eurobarometer and others who have been uh, surveying this kind of thing. Um, yeah, so I mean, you look historically, the, the Baltic countries and Poland have this long history of being up against the Soviet Union, um, and before that, uh, the Russian Empire, and then more recently, um, you, you still have you know, this looming presence of Russia, and that's going to be a story that we'll return to later. Uh, yeah, just as a side note, um, on the U.S., Poland is again the highest, and that slide about the, the Russian presence uh, may provide some geopolitical kinds of people uh, may make, make sense to them. Uh, the USA, interestingly, it's uh, Slovakia that is the lowest. Um, we don't really go into that story, but maybe we could talk about that. What I want to point out, though, is you know, this is the kinds of data and the kinds of presentation from surveys that is the most common. It's just kind of, let's look at the average for the full sample. So, you know, you survey 1,500 people, that's what we do, and those 1,500 people are representative of the full population of the country. So when we average the answers across the sample, we can generalize to the full population and then compare across countries. The thing is that not every check is the same. You know, they don't all feel the same way about China. You know, sometimes people are divided by very simple demographic characteristics, like gender. Um, generally speaking, men are more uh, aggressive on foreign policy. Um, age can matter. In fact, I have a puzzle about just how much age matters in terms of British attitudes towards China. Uh, old people in the UK really don't like China. I think part of that is a Cold War effect. Um, it's not just the fact that as you get older you get more conservative, um, because it's not really the case that greater conservatism is associated with more negative attitudes towards China. Anyway, um, whoops, the point here is, is Mark Twain's old adage that people can throw statistics at you and sometimes when they, they throw the full sample average at you, it, it can hide things that are really important. You know, just telling us that, you know, say the average Latvian is kind of so-so on China actually hides what's interesting about the Latvian data, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, yeah, so I'll take an example, and I'll start with Latvia. Um, I'll, I'll do two examples. So our, our Latvian survey data was great because it reflected the actual Latvian population, which is divided between Russian speakers and Latvian speakers. Should this surprise us at all, that Russian speakers are much warmer towards China on average than Latvian speakers? Or even more of a, of a split? Um, this one is Russia. Sorry, I don't have the, the um, they're not labeled here. But this second column is um, Russian-speaking Latvians on average um, feel much warmer towards Russia than do Latvian-speaking Latvians. Shouldn't surprise at all, right? So this is an ethno-linguistic divide, which is a huge cleavage in Latvian society and politics. Unsurprisingly, it has a big impact on China attitudes, and even more on Russia attitudes. This is what all of you should be more familiar with, is that there can be divides in political ideology that matter. So here we have... Um, I hope I don't butcher the names of uh, Zaman voters and Drevos voters. So President Zaman, is that correct? Close? Zeman. 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 So President Zaman voters are warmer on average towards China than opposition Drevos supporters. It's 14 degrees on a 100 uh, point scale, which is a medium sized difference statistically. You actually just just eyeballing it is not enough. You actually have to run the statistics to see if that's a meaningful difference. Um, but notice that both are negative. So the scale is 0 to 100. So 50 would be neutral. So this is actually quite interesting. Even the so-called pro-China, you know, Zaman supporters are not pro-China. <laughs> They're just less negative, again. 
uh, about China. Okay, um, a couple of other variables uh, we wanted to, to measure uh, because of the, you know, the earlier work that Richard and his colleagues have done on Czech politics. Um, and more broadly on CEE politics, we were interested in the sort of um, self-identification in belonging more to the East or West. Do you identify more? I can't remember the wording, if it was identify more or find, uh, feel more belonging, but essentially it was a kind of self-identification. Do you see yourself as more of the East or West? Now, obviously it's both, right? And we're forcing people, I mean, most people in the CEE have some attachment with both the East and the West, but we force them to place themselves on a continuum. And while that does some, da some, uh, it does some damage to how they actually self-identify, um, it is nonetheless useful. Um, and we found the sequence pretty much made sense. I mean, Poland and Latvia, you know, those are countries right on Russia's border. You know, it's not surprising that they're going to be like, no, I'm not Eastern. <laughs> uh, and in fact, it's, it's in a way less meaningful because it, uh, East and West in other countries like the Czech Republic, um, Slovakia, it has to do, to, to belong to the East and West is to say something about, you know, am I pro-Western? It, it may be more linked with different political values. Correct me if I'm wrong, Richard. Um, but my sense is, and I haven't looked at this carefully, but <clears throat> I think <clears throat> over here you get Poles and Latvians on both the left and right of the political spectrum. It's just that they're united in saying, no, no, we're not East, we're not Russians. Um, so it's kind of a nationalist imperative to say, we're different, and therefore we identify with the West. We also had questions about your country's communist past. Um, and again, not really surprising that Poland was the most negative. Um, Latvia would have been more negative if it wasn't for all the Russian-speaking Latvians. Uh, here, the Czech Republic is, is a little bit lower, but overall the sequences are pretty similar, which was interested us. So we actually looked, I want, this will be the only numbers chart, so Please don't uh, worry too much. Um, all this is is taking these four very four one two three four sorry five variables and looking at all their intercorrelations. So we basically um, let's see. So this is um, the extent to which you identify as East versus West. How much does that correlate with your feelings towards China <clears throat> across the different countries? <coughs> All I really want to point out here is that if we look vertically instead of horizontally, we see that in the Czech case, all of these numbers are substantial. So what, what does this mean? Basically, these numbers are called um, bivariate coefficients or correlations. If you square these numbers and you get what's called an R squared, it actually give you, gives you a percentage of, of variance that overlaps. So if, you, if you're a visual person like I am, you can think of a Venn diagram and uh, how much the two circles overlap. So if the two circles you know, touch each other but they don't cross, there's no overlap, zero. So here, if you square 0.02, you're still gonna get zero. And so there, there's just no overlap between how much Poles self-identify as East versus West and how they feel about China. Um, but in the Czech case, if you square 0.3, it's 9%. So in the social sciences, when you're talking about how people feel and think about things, that's a massive number. I mean, if you think about how many things go into, you know, how do you feel about China, you know, do you see yourself as more from the east or west? There's so many things. So to get 10, almost 10% 10 of shared variance between these two variables is actually quite substantial. So anyway, we get a lot of correlations and a lot of them quite large uh, with the Czech Republic. By contrast, look at the Polish case. It's much more scattered and smaller numbers and many that aren't significant that are quite small. 
And if we just look a little more carefully just at the, the um, examples that have to do with China, so these are the variables correlating with China. So uh, east-west identification with China, communist past in China, communism in China, Russia in China, these all correlate and quite substantially among the Czech public. But then if we look at the, the Polish public, the only one that correlates is between Russia and China. The only thing that correlates with attitudes towards China is attitudes towards Russia in Poland. These other things don't correlate at all. So that was like immediately, huh, what's going on there? There's a puzzle we want to look into more carefully. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to show you the same finding with a different method. Um, Richard and his team decided to include a word association open-ended item in the survey. We, when you think of China, what is the first thing you think of? And you have to actually type in a word. And this is for the Czech data, and this is for the Polish data. <coughs> Communism and totalitarianism are high up there. Um, whereas for the Polish, whoops, for the Polish data, none of it. It's kind of generic stuff, topical in the new stuff like COVID-19. Okay, so now this is where it, it looks kind of crazy, um, and it is crazy statistically. It, it actually is fairly complicated from a statistical perspective, but I personally, because I'm a visual person, I find flowcharts fairly intuitive, so I hope this can make a little bit of sense to you. Basically what, what I did uh, was I took, you know, how you feel towards China is what we want to explain. And I started with this self-identification as East or West. And again, this is the, what we were looking at earlier. Remember that basically almost 10% of the variance of feelings towards China is accounted for directly by do you see yourself as belonging more to the East or West. But then you would imagine that, you know, People who see themselves as more belonging to the East or West may have different attitudes towards Czechoslovakia's uh, communist past, towards communism as a political system today, uh, feelings towards Russia. And indeed, what we found was all three of those uh, other variables mediated the relationship between. And that's what this does here. So, what, I, what, what this means here, this transformation, the, the thick line on the top and the dotted line on the bottom is basically when you add these variables into the model, the direct effect disappears. It becomes statistically insignificant. That's why these are dotted lines. They're not significant. There's a non-relationship. So what does that mean? What that means is that essentially this is how this shapes this. So mediators are mechanisms. They're a way that we can get a little bit more closely at causation. So we, I can't make a strong causal argument here because of the nature of the data, but it is, it's kind of a, a syndrome, certainly, that we can say that you know, a major reason why people who, for example, identify more with the West in the Czech Republic um, feel more negatively about China. So the East was a higher number, that's why this is positive. So the other way to put it is if you identify more with the East, maybe you're more of a Slavic person, more from the countryside, definitely not from Prague, right? Or else you're part of a, I assume Prague is more progressive. It's the big city, right? Um, Anyway, if you're more from the East, you like China more, you, you see yourself as more from the West, you dislike China more. How does that play out? People who identify more with the, the West, you have to reverse the, the uh, sign here, uh, will be more negative about the communist past. They'll be more negative about communism as a political system. They'll be more negative about Russia, and that has a big, big impact on China. So basically what we're able to show is that essentially one reason why these east-west identifications are so strongly associated with China attitudes in the Czech sample, in the Czech population, is because of the associations with these other variables. So that was the Czech case. Um, the other case I want to use as a case study, and then I'll be able to sort of stop, is uh, Poland. 
because that was the, the um, other extreme that we talked about. Um, what's interesting here is that there's no direct relationship. In fact, we saw that in the table earlier. Uh, whether you self-identify as more of the East or West um, as a poll does not impact how you feel about China. And again, my hypothesis about this is that, at least in the Polish context, sort of everyone wants to think that they're from the West. Um, and so there's not enough variation in the Polish sample for it to really matter too much for China. However, so there's no direct relationship. However, these other variables do matter, but only as, they're, as it mediates through Russia. So feelings towards the Polish communist past has no direct effect on China attitudes. Feelings towards communism as a political system also has no direct effect on uh, feelings towards China. But all three of these things have impacts on feelings towards Russia. And then feelings towards Russia shape attitudes towards China. So this is this kind of metaphor that we came up with. Actually, I take responsibility, if you don't know, like right? <laughs> Richard went along with it. I'm not sure if he embraced it or he just was humoring me. But um, I, I kind of pictured myself in Poland. I have been to Warsaw once. <laughs> but I just pictured myself, given my understanding of Polish history and the geography, that you know Russia is just an overwhelming presence. Russia on the one side, Germany on the other side. I mean, Poland, have, they have not been lucky. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a, a cruel fate in many ways. Um, same thing for Latvia and the Baltics. You, you just can just imagine that just about everything they do, the way they think about China, is mediated through how they think about Russia. And in fact, that's my understanding of what the Latvian elite decided to do. And if you look at our data, which I just showed you, in terms of the Latvian-speaking Latvians, what the Latvian government did vis-a-vis -vis China is absolutely spot on. They will have the full support of uh, the Latvian-speaking Latvian public. The Russian-speaking, oh, I'm confusing two Lithuania. countries. Lithuania. Yeah, yeah, Lithuania. But it would be similar in Latvia. Okay. I'm a US-China expert. <laughs> I do some on Japan and Korea. <laughs> Uh, I'm just learning my, my Europe. Um, it's fun, though. I'm really enjoying it. I'm really enjoying it. Okay, um, yes, so policy conclusions. These survey findings basically provide public opinion support for what I think most analysts of elite level CEE policy towards China have concluded, which is that things are not looking good. Things have taken a, a negative turn. Um, it suggests that if China becomes yet more authoritarian under Xi Jinping, um, pro-Western CEE publics will continue to sour on China. So just as you see among the, um, you know, the opposition uh, public in the Czech Republic, you know, the, their progressive politics, their sympathies for the Dalai Lama, for Tibet, for Xinjiang, you know, all of the, so the tougher China gets on, on those countries, the more uh, those, those places, um, the more authoritarian C gets, the more negative, progressive um, Central and Eastern Europeans will become. Um, and if China tightens its security relations with Putin's Russia, I think nationalist publics in some CEE countries, I should probably qualify that a little bit more, but certainly places like Poland, you know, where nationalist publics are very concerned about Russia. You know, if they see China cozying up to Russia, that's going to have a negative spillover effect on their attitudes towards China. So this is a pretty diverse range of CEE publics that could be, you know, becoming more negative towards China if China cozies up more with Russia. So this is kind of a counter story to this alarmism about a new Sino-Soviet menace or threat that, you know, China might beware of what it's hoping for when it thinks about an, an alliance with Russia, that there could be some negative consequences of that. Um, the specters of communism in Russia Basically, this is the, the finding of the public opinion surveys. Um, 
seem to, to be further darkening uh, CED public opinion towards China. So thank you. I can't pronounce that. <laughs> um, we are really thrilled that this paper uh, will be coming out shortly in a really terrific journal, Communist and Post-Communist Studies. Um, so if you're interested, we can send you the, the current draft, um, and it should be in print shortly.